Hello, everyone. Welcome to the morning show. We're broadcasting on Channel 9 and on WJOPLP Newburyport, FM 96.3. We're also broadcasting on Newburyport Community Media's YouTube channel at ncmhub.org. I'm your host, Mary Jacobson, and I'm just delighted to welcome today's guest, the, author, the authors of the book, Unacceptable, Privileged Deceit and the Making of the College Admission Scandal, are here today to talk about their book. And they will also be uh, featured at the New Report Literary Festival coming up on Sunday, April 25th at 9 a.m. We'll give you more information about that later. But let me start by introducing you to Melissa Korn. She's a reporter for the Wall Street Journal in New York covering higher education. Previously, she wrote for Dow Jones Newswires. She's a graduate of Cornell University and the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. Melissa, welcome. Thank you for visiting the morning show. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, my pleasure. And now let's introduce Jennifer Levitt. She's a national reporter for the Wall Street Journal in Boston, covering general news, economics, and politics. Previously, she wrote for the Providence Journal. She's a two-time Pulitzer team finalist, and she graduated from Loyola University of Maryland. Jennifer, welcome to you, too, and thank you for visiting the morning show. My pleasure. Great to be here. Thank you. Great to have you. Well, first off, I want to congratulate you both on your extraordinarily well-researched, complex, and totally compelling narrative of the Varsity Blues college admission scandal. It, um, it has a reach and scope worthy of a, a George Eliot novel. <laughs> it felt <laughs> revelatory, not just about the spider web of bribery, mendacity, and shallowness reflected of the parents involved in the scandal, and the coaches and the, shall we call him the grifter in chief, Rick Singer, um, who were directly involved in it. But it also feels like a microcosm of how a blend of cynicism, corruption, and a colossal sense of entitlement that informs American culture at large created the conditions that invited and, and in a way almost ensured that this kind of rigging, rigging of admissions would evolve. Um, there's so much that I want to learn from you about this, but first, I'm curious to learn what drew each of you to this story. I know you were covering it for the Wall Street Journal, but you also decided to write the book, and it must have absorbed an extraordinary amount of time and energy. What connection did you feel to the story that drew you to put the time into writing the book? Whoever would like to begin. Sure. So I think it all happened in such a whirlwind uh, manner. We started covering the scandal when the news broke uh, out of Boston in on March 12th, 2019, which I think is a day that changed the lives of the people who were charged and also our lives. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that same day, we started hearing from literary agents saying, this is going to be a book. Do you oh. want to be the one story? Oh. And neither of us had written a book before. We hadn't even worked together that much before, uh, and but we knew each other's reputation, and we said, "Sure, let's try this out. Why not?" It's not like we have, you know, day jobs and everything else going on in our lives, but we we jumped into it, and we found the story just so exciting and complex, and parts of it were relatable, and parts of it were absolutely horrifying, and I think it really reflects so much of what's going on in America at this moment in terms of questions about merit and access yeah. and equity and fairness and all of that. So there was just so much to grab onto. It was hard to put it, you know, kind of narrow it down into a book length. I feel like it, it could have been a, a trilogy or something. Well, it may be. <laughs> I give it time. And, you know, it's not every day the literary agents are calling you. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm very grateful that it went so smoothly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Jennifer? Well, it was, it was the same. We, we jumped in, you know, that first day we started working together on it. And um, uh, and I remember Melissa got a call from the agent and she called me. And I, my initial thought was, oh, my gosh, you know, I can't imagine, you know, uh, uh, the work that's involved. But I think there was like a naivety that, you know, a, a unfamiliarity with this process that helped because I had no idea how hard it was going to be. And then of course, <laughs> I, when it got, the book got, proposal got accepted, we celebrated and we cheered. And then we quickly went into this kind of uh, terrified mode because <laughs> you have so many court documents um, and you have enough that you could almost write a book based on public records, but that's not mm. how we work as Wall Street Journal reporters. You want to get to the bottom of the story, which means, 
okay, now we have to find out what really happened. Yeah. And that w- began a year of craziness and all-nighters and travel all across the country. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad that you did because it is such an engaging story. And some of the nooks and crannies of the story are the most interesting parts. <laughs> but to yeah. understand the scandal, you know, it helps to understand the, the nature of the overarching scheme that its mastermind Rick Singer devised. He famously called it the side door. Um, and through that, he was able to uh, basically to sell and guarantee acceptances at highly selective colleges to the parents who participated. Could you first just fill us in on the side door that he uh, manipulated and maneuvered? Sure, there were two prongs to his scheme. So the first uh, had to do with standardized testing actually, where he would help uh, his clients' kids uh, earn better or get better scores, didn't necessarily earn them, uh, get better scores. He had a proctor that he worked with that he would uh, pay the proctor. He would pay off test site administrators to look the other way when his proctor came in and fixed uh, a student's wrong answers after the fact, uh, if the kid was in the dark, or even fed them answers uh, during the exam if they knew what was going on. And that boosted their test score. It wasn't a guarantee to get in, but it certainly or potentially gave them an edge at certain schools. So uh, that was kind of, um, in some ways, lower level in terms of the dollar amount he charged. And he knew that people really did want a guarantee. So the other prong was this side door um, where he would craft these fake athletic profiles for a for a teen even if they didn't play the sport he would say that they were you know MVP and all state and internationally recognized and whatever the sport was and he would have uh, he would pitch them to schools as these great athletes and he would work with coaches and others inside universities um, giving them payments to flag these kids as recruits and to take them on as recruits because it was you know taking one of their slots for athletes and singer really understood how much autonomy those uh, coaches had in making their decisions and putting together their their lists of flagged prospects and he you know they were able to really take advantage of that yeah they certainly were um it was his kind of inside knowledge uh because he had worked as a coach previously um, and he actually did some legitimate college counseling, I understand from your book, but he saw where the, 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 um, the fractures were in the system, where things could, could seep in um, and was able to then exploit them. You know, so, so there were vulnerabilities, as I, as I understand from your book, with, within the, the families, the participating coaches, and the admissions process itself that appeared to me to have set the stage for and then enabled the scam. Um, and I hope you could provide context for some of the context that I want to ask you about, about how these converged in enabling Varsity Blues to take place. First, the highly and increasingly competitive market for college admissions, uh, especially at colleges that are perceived to be very high status and highly selective colleges, and the idea that admission staff and counselors send to students that they need to find a hook I think it's the language they use, or as Singer put it, that these young people, um, 17 or maybe 18 year old at max had to build their brand at this tender age in high school in order to stand out from hundreds and thousands of other athletes. And I wonder what you think about these messages that the admissions people send out publicly, there's nothing hidden about it, um, to parents and students. Um, How did this facilitate, do you think, the um, the vulnerability of the system to this scandal. Yeah, I think I think we we definitely felt that um, while the the parents um, in, engaged in some pretty egregious behavior, obviously, and Rick Singer, that there were multiple people um, involved, um, whether you know legally or not, um, in laying the the groundwork for this. And certainly, the colleges by you know, promoting their low acceptance rates with press releases. Uh, creating this frenzy about how it's, you know, it's gone down. I mean, maybe some of them have stopped that, but word always seems to seep out. Um, we've only admitted this year. And so these, these people looking at this, um, we've got to apply to more schools next year. We've got to do more. We've got to, you know, so you can, you can understand where this frenzy sets in. And then on top of that, you have a lot of people 
who are looking at the same 10 or 15 yeah. schools. And that was one thing that is, is really probably needs to change. And we talked with a lot of college counselor, college, you know, guidance counselors who sort of lamented the fact they just couldn't get people to look beyond um, these schools to other schools because the fact is there are so many good schools that accept many, many of, of the students who, who apply. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was this, um, there's this narrative of limited resources, right? That are, mm. that, that, um, there are only so many spots at these quote unquote good schools. Yeah. And as a result, uh, you have to fight and you have to really find a way to stand out to get in there. And, uh, you know, some people were willing to go to extreme lengths to do that, obviously. And as Jennifer said, there's a lot of blame to be cast about here, whether it's the parents who were involved in Rick Singer, um, universities for the lack of oversight, also for the messaging that they give that this is really the only ticket to su a successful life right. and high schools as well by really being quite um, selective in wh who they hold up as a successful graduate. You know, yeah. it's not necessarily the person who went to a community college or a local state school. It's the one who went over to an Ivy or to Stanford or something like that. And right. those, those messages come through and they uh, students and their parents internalize it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and somehow lost in the picture is the idea of fit uh, between a, a young person and the college or university where they would best thrive or be happiest. Um, it gets lost uh, somehow in the quest for high status. And that's another thing that I wanted to ask you about. Um, it's the equation of acceptance at a small number, kind of like a zero sum game, as you were suggesting, Melissa. Uh, of these elite colleges, that that's the highest status um, for parents. Um, as it, it seems to launch a kind of a almost Darwinian struggle <laughs> for parental bragging rights, really. And 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 I wonder, um, you know, how much of a factor do you think this played for these particular parents in in them overruling whatever good sense they might have had? Yeah, ego was huge there. Um, yeah. They, this was, you know, having your kid get admitted to one of these schools was a sign of your success as a parent. And it was just that, it was that simple. It was, you clearly did something right if your kid got into one of these schools with a five or 10% acceptance rate. If they were having to settle, God forbid, for some school that admitted most of its applicants, <laughs> you, you screwed up somewhere along the way. <laughs> I have a story I want to share with you along those lines that, um, you know, a friend of mine, I used to live in Arlington and, and I had a friend who's, um, who lived in Carlisle. You know, Carlisle and, you know, Jennifer, you're from Massachusetts. Carlisle is a very kind of affluent uh, area. Yes. And, and uh, like Lexington, Carlisle, Concord Carlisle High School is very, very competitive and, and takes very pr much pride in sending their graduates off to the most elite of these institutions. So my friend, uh, Sarah, her son, Sam, when he was graduating, decided he just was going to take a year off. He wanted to, you know, play in his band and do some traveling. And she would tell me that she'd go to these parties or, or events with other parents from Concord Carlisle High School. And they'd say, well, where's Sam going? And she would say, Sam's not going to college. And it would stop the conversation cold. <laughs> it was like jaws. Were, there was nothing. She said sometimes they would literally... They were so dumbfounded they would just walk away <laughs> because they really were left without knowing anything. There was nothing to say in response. They couldn't compute. So I'm sorry, Jennifer, you may have had something you wanted oh. to say about this as well. well I, just, I was just going to add to what you were both saying yeah. that, um, <laughs> that it is just another marker of class and privilege, you know, in our society. I mean, it kind of reminds me of the, you know, the, the white Range Rover with the, um, the Nantucket airport sticker, <laughs> on the or yeah. right? It just says yeah. something and, and, and college is put in that bucket. And, you know, I remember one um, uh, mis private admissions officer in Manhattan said it well, she said, I think, you know, people come into me and they've just been moving through elite circles, the right club, going to the right restaurants, um, the right vacation places, the right schools. And they just kind of assume they're going to continue along. And then they come to me and I tell them, well, you might get in there, but you, you better think about some plan B. You know, you might not get to the best country club. You might have to settle for, you know, the not like the municipal pool, but like maybe between, you know, <laughs> <And> <laughs> there's like this dock 
Yeah. <laughs> that was so appealing. He just didn't tell you that. that. He, he, he might, you know, he, he had a way. Yeah. It, it's so interesting. And, and, and as you were saying before, it's um, so emblematic of certain aspects of our culture at large. Well, um, following up on that, uh, you, you, you made reference to this earlier, um, but I, I think it, it, it bears uh, uh, kind of underscoring because to me, reading a book, it seemed like a large part of what enabled this scam to go on for as long as it did and to absorb so many people was just the, um, the lack of oversight. Um, these were just completely confabulated stories um, that Rick Singer was submitting about these young people. They would even use photographs, for example, of somebody playing water polo that wasn't even, uh, even of the kid. It was somebody else, <laughs> you know? And so that uh, lack of oversight uh, or the lack of interest in verifying information supplied on admissions forms enabled some whopping deceptions to go absolutely undetected. And, and I wonder what your thoughts are about um, you know, what role this played in enabling the scam and what made the colleges so, I think lackadaisical um, is maybe the right term, or you supply the one that you think is a better fit. Um, uh, Cause that, you know, it just, there was nothing to stop it if nothing was being checked on. So the lies appeared to me to get bigger and the deceptions just gargantuan whoppers. Um, so what role did that play? So um, there's, so much trust baked into the college admissions system. Mm. And a large part of that is because uh, there's limited time and limited resources yeah. to review applications, especially these schools that are getting tens of thousands of applications for a couple thousand spots, right? They are, they don't have enormous admission staff. Some of them hire outside readers just for a season to kind of dig through it all. But they have to trust that the applicant is being honest in his or her application. And if they're using the Common App or any kind of school application, there's often a place for them to sign and say, you know, I confirm this information is accurate. Uh, and you kind of just have to leave it at that because they yeah. can't go and fact check and make sure that somebody was actually the president of a club and not just the yeah. vice president yeah. or any of that. And with athletics, they're the same thing. They're the admissions officers don't necessarily know what makes a particularly good water polo player or rower. True. They <laughs> kind of have to assume, I, I don't. No, um, I don't they either. Have, <laughs> <laughs> they just have to assume that the coach has the team yeah. and the university's best interests at heart because why would a coach possibly use one of their very yeah. valuable team spots, roster spots for somebody who's not going to help the team? And the answer is, well, if they're getting paid on the side um, <laughs> or yeah. you know, they're, getting some, they're getting something personal in return yeah. for it. But it just, it was almost this naive outlook that as if uh, this was an uncorruptible system that yeah. allowed it to continue for so long. Yeah. Which made it vulnerable then to the, the betrayal of that right. trust. By and, people who, yeah. Yeah. And Jennifer, you know, came across some really interesting early examples of Singer encouraging clients to bend the truth a little bit and kind of almost mm. see how far they could push it. Mm. Mm -hmm. How far can you stretch the line? <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. really interesting. Yeah, there was this yeah. creep, right? Yeah. Well, you know, talking about blurring, uh, crossing or blurring lines, there's also kind of a blurring of lines I wanted to get your comments on between but colleges talk about legacy admits, and that means the descendants of people who are alumni of the college, um, and also parents who make legal um, and usually pretty huge donations to schools, which are functionally tantamount to, in effect, buying admission slots, sometimes for several generations, depending upon the size of the donation. Um, so there's a blurring between that, it seems to me, and the illegal, illegal bribery of Singer's side door, as he called it. So I wonder what role you think the appearance of college admissions as a, a game, not always based on merit, um, uh, on, on people kind of thinking that it was somehow almost normative to game the system um, through donations, special tutors, expensive independent coaches who will, in essence, almost write your kid's college admissions essay for them. And what role do you think this may have played in opening the door to the idea of crossing lines? Because it might not have seemed all that different. 
Yeah. Why don't you go ahead, Melissa? Because you. Uh, sure. Um. So I think of it as a kind of a spectrum of behavior. Mm -hmm. So you have kind of the, the more innocuous things like getting test prep or hiring a private tennis coach or things like that, which again, only a very privileged few can afford to do that, but that's considered kind of not, not egregious these days. And then it kind of creeps on and on to hiring a private and independent college counselor who will help you mm -hmm. uh, edit your essay or in some cases write it for you. Um, you, and then you move on to the large donations, right? How can you kind of stand out? Well, if you've got a few million dollars laying around, that's a good way. But uh, then what Rick Singer engaged in kind of is way over at the other end in yeah. terms of gaining an edge. And one of the defenses of some of the parents has been that this is just, this was just kind of an extreme version of what already happened. Uh -huh. You know, universities development offices don't call it a quid pro quo, uh -huh. but you know, wink, wink, nudge, Nudge, we all know that's really what it is. Yeah. And I mean, that's the that's the defense of this, that this was just an extension of that mm -hmm. um, with these donations to athletic programs. And, you know, schools are as clear as they can be in saying, no, um, a large donation won't buy you a an acceptance. But at the same time, they don't outright say that because they don't want to turn away the prospect of getting donations. It's a very right. tricky, you know, we, we call the chapter about this in our book, uh, The Gray Area. And it really is a murky place. And there was a lot of room for manipulation, um, I think. And Singer found that. He found it out and he figured out a way to use it. Mm -hmm. I like that idea of the spectrum of behaviors from the outright illegal, <laughs> which Rick Singer's was, to the sketchy, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> and then the more legitimate. So anyway, yeah, thank you for that. That's really interesting. Well, you know, you mentioned millions of dollars sometimes for um, sometimes tens of billions of dollars uh, being donated. And I found that one of the truly jaw dropping aspects of the stories you tell is the sheer volume of disposable cash <laughs> that the families involved in this had at their disposal to pay to cheat. Um, it's a staggering amount of money that they were seemingly willing to pay, you know, just I'll, I'll, I'll write the check, <laughs> you know. Or in, one, in a couple of cases, I'll pay the cash. Yes, the cash. That's <laughs> right. I know. So is it your sense that this is ex really large amounts of wealth, that that created um, uh, or amplified a kind of a bubble of entitlement? You mentioned the country clubs before um, yeah. that kind of surrounded these families because it probably didn't occur to many of them um, that this would come back to haunt them. Yeah, I think, I think absolutely. I think the answer, it's a great question. And I think the answer is yes. And there's actually been some really interesting research about wealth and empathy. Uh, there's a pretty well-known study, uh, you may have seen it in uh, around 2012 by some researchers at University of Berkeley, where they planted themselves at busy intersections and found that people in luxury cars were more likely to just um, disobey the rules, not let people go in the crosswalk even after they'd made eye contact with them, cut people off. So they wanted to, you know, they figured, well, maybe they just borrowed the car, they don't know. So they repeated this study in all kinds of ways and they, they came to the conclusion that wealthy people were more likely to, to cut and cheat. Um, Interesting. And it wasn't that they were hardwired, like they were bad people or something, but it was their their theory was that when you live an insular life, you become less sensitive to the needs yeah. of others. You don't rely on other people as much. You have a lot more independence. Yeah. You have abundance. And um, and I, I saw this firsthand a few times. I think both of us did in talking with people. I remember one conversation with a mom who um, she knew that she was doing something wrong. Uh, she didn't know what she was breaking a federal uh, law, which probably is reasonable. She, but she, you know, certainly she hid this, whatever. But she said what never occurred to her was that she might be taking a spot from someone. Interesting. It didn't cross her mind. And of yeah. course, for many of us reading it, it's the first, it's one of the most outrageous things when we right. read it because, of, oh, but you took that away. There's only so many slots at these schools. So anyway, yeah, it's really think, interesting. Along with the wealth also comes this, expectation that every challenge in life can have a transactional fix to it, mm -hmm. right? When you uh, have a leak in the ceiling, you hire somebody to come and fix it. When you need new uh, flowers outside, you hire a gardener. When you need, uh, 
you know, an accountant, you, you need to do your taxes, you hire an accountant when you need someone to figure out, navigate college, you hire a college counselor and let them take care of the problem. And if you throw enough money at it, it can be fixed. Yeah. And a lot of these people, that's just the way that they had operated in so many aspects of their lives for so long that of course you're going to hire somebody to help with this. Now, the fact that they hired this particular person for these particular things is, <laughs> you know, slightly uh, different, but there was kind of, it was a, it was a no brainer that they would hire outside help mm -hmm. to guide them through the process. Yeah, absolutely. That makes perfect sense. There was a logic to it from their perspective and also a, a habituation to it. Mm -hmm. um, but when you hired Rick Singer, you could wind up in jail <laughs> as, as many of them did. So <laughs> I don't think a lot of them thought they would, would get caught layered on top of this all is um is was a real sense of, of hubris like a lot of people yeah. might have thought about doing this but then you check yourself like yeah. well what if i got caught and yeah. i think that that was the downfall for some people is they just you know there was that arrogance and then also yeah. i'm not going to get caught yeah absolutely and he would well, tell people that as well that how it they he, it had always worked so and it had yeah. mm -hmm. right and it it didn't come out until it came out. <laughs> right. One of the most incredible things about this is that the, the scheme itself didn't, you know, didn't collapse because somebody labbed uh, about it. It was because it was tied to a very, an unrelated securities fraud case and somebody involved in that took them off to a different bribe and that then brought up Rick Singer's name. And it, it took a lot of things fitting together for the feds to uncover this and had they not pursued that securities fraud that pump and dump case singer may still be operating now which to me reading your book that that was kind of one of the amazing things because um you know it was uh, so many people were involved um and with that many people involved you'd think that um that somebody would have talked eventually um, and so it was just astonishing to me um, that it went able to go on for as long as it did. Well, um, I, I'm curious to find out um, to a person, the parents claim that they just love their children so much and they were only trying to do what was best for their children. And their moral vision was just a cloud clouded over by the intensity of their love. And I wonder what both of you made having met many of these parents of that rationale. Well, I, th I think it's, it's, it's certainly true that they, that they love their children, um, you know, that they wanted to see their kids happy. Um, and I think people can relate to that, um, that, you know, it, it feels, it feels good to have someone, um, you know, whether it's your child, your spouse, whatever, achieve and do well, it reflects well on you, right? It reflects yeah. well on the family, it just feels good. And, and, um, uh, but as far as uh, rationale, I mean, did they love their children? more than the single mom trying to work with her kids through college or the millions of families who were faced with really bad odds, you know, or, or much harder than they thought and had to go to a plan B and it's just kind of go through the acceptance and disappointment and deal with it. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think they did. Yeah. Right. They loved their kids, but they also loved themselves and their yeah. image and their reputation and what this said about the family. And you know, some of the parents have admitted it was about their own ego in all of this. Yeah. Um, and you know, I feel like we, we should say here, there are some parents who have pleaded not guilty and they're expected to go to trial this fall. Oh. And you know, a lot, of, a lot of them say like, what I did wasn't wrong. Mm -hmm. um, the rules, you know, the rules are complicated and mm -hmm. what I did was okay under the rules because they're kind of that murky gray area. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I was just helping my kid. And wouldn't you do the same? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a persistent, um, I mean, it is, it strikes me as one way of defining love. Um, and many of us might have a different definition because, um, well, I'll ask you that as, as one of my remaining questions is what impact did it have on the kids in general? Yeah. It was a it was a real um, range. I mean, first, I think that there's a huge emotional impact um, when the, our book has the first interview um, with any of the teens. Um, and I hope people can can read it because he he, he would, comes across as sounding uh, like one of the wisest people in the book. Uh -huh. um, just 
you know, just a real sense of betrayal, um, a feeling of reality just being flipped upside down. Um, all these years of being told on one hand, you're great, you're, you're doing well, you're, whatever you, you know, achieve your dreams um, by parents and schools and so forth. And then in the end, none of that mattered. Um, so there was that. Then you had the practical aspect of your ruined academic record. Um, Melissa yeah. can talk a little about that. Um, yeah, because some yes. of them, um, they lost their places um, in the college. Right, some of the students, yep, some of the students were um, kicked out of school. Um, those who were kind of in the, in the throes of the admission season uh, had their offers rescinded. Um, Others were able to plead their cases and prove that they were qualified to be there on their own merits yeah. and have stayed at the schools. It's a real range. And, you know, no matter what, the, and some others had gone through college already, had graduated, were in grad school, finished grad school, had careers, right? Because it has been going on for so long. And they did perfectly fine in the institutions once they got there. Um, and it's, you know, it's this reminder that they would have been fine wherever they went, but now they have this asterisk attached to their name for yeah, forever. Forever, yeah. Well, um, I, I did want to ask, uh, we don't have a lot of time left, but I wanted to ask about the impact that doing this research, um, aside from getting your first book out, <laughs> how did this research and the things you learned about this scandal, the people involved and its larger implications, what impact did the research you did have on each of you personally? I'll say um, I'm a parent. My child is quite a bit younger than these, uh, you know, than these folks that were involved in the case. But I do think something that startled me um, throughout the reporting was finding myself relating to some of the insecurities that some of these parents had throughout. Um, and you know, I want to be doing what's best for my kid. What is that? Where do I look to find out what that is? Whose advice do I follow? All of that. Um, was, was relatable and that's that's unsettling, right? You don't want to see yourself in some of these parents. Uh, it is, you know, a good reminder to uh, keep some perspective on just how much things like college admissions do or don't matter yeah. in, in the grand scheme of things in someone's life story. Um, it's not the, you know, it's not the conclusion of your life. It's hopefully the first step after high school and that's all. Yeah. Um, so perspective is definitely something to take away from this. And that's a really wise thing to be able to take away from it. So how about you, Jennifer? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, one of the things that surprised me um, about when, you know, in talking with a lot of these people is like how successful they were and how, um, but also how insecure. Yeah. And, and it was like nothing was enough. And yeah. They, they didn't feel that it could be enough. And I think, you know, some of them even said that as higher I got, the more I had to have. And I think that's a cautionary tale for everybody in today's world. I mean, you know, if you're in a competitive job or world, you can just feel like um, you can get caught in that trap. And yeah. I think that's um, a, good, a good reminder to step back. Um, I also, you know, I felt like the, the you, you kind of get a sense of how, of how it works for some of these families and it takes, I think, the sheen away a, a little from what you think is like, you know, a lot of people working really hard to, and yeah. they, they're deserving to get these spots and, and um, you realize um, sort of how, the, how broken the system is in so many ways. And I think it's a good perspective um, to have, you know, because people um, tend to compare themselves to others. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, yeah. it, you have to think about, um, you know, where people came from and what they had to overcome. And it helps to, I think, you know, look at everyone a little, it gives you more perspective when you meet people and. Um, you, useful lessons and cautionary <laughs> tales. So thank you yeah. both so much for that. And so you're going to be at the Newburyport Literary Festival on Sunday, April 25th at 9 a.m. And everybody, we've just scratched the surface of what's in the book. <laughs> so go to the website. Uh, you can register there and get all the information you need. Jennifer, Melissa, thank you so much. It's been wonderful to talk to you. Thank you for your book. And, and thank you for taking time to come to this interview today. I really appreciate it. So hey, thanks so much for having us. It's my pleasure. Thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you join us next Thursday at 9 on Channel 9 for the morning show. If you miss any part of today's show, it'll be available for viewing on Port Media's YouTube channel playlist for the morning show at ncmhub.org. Just click on the icon. 
Each show will also air on WJOP 96.3 FM on Friday at 8, and again the following Tuesday at 4 p.m. and Wednesday at 3 p.m. It'll also be available as a podcast on the SoundCloud. Just click on the cloud icon at ncmhub.org. Thank you both so much. It's wonderful to talk to you. You too. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you very, very much. Take care now. You too. I wish you luck on your next book and be sure and let me know what it is. <laughs> okay. <Thank you. laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.